Well, good afternoon. I'm here joined uh, by Justice Minister Doug Schweitzer and Arisia Lenny, Chair of the Alberta Fair Deal Panel, for a very important announcement today, the release of the report of the Fair Deal Panel. Uh, and so I'd like to, uh, first of all, invite Arisia to say a few words, summarizing the work of their panel um, and uh, with, with a real expression of gratitude on behalf of Albertans. Uh, Arisia is, used to work with uh, Peter Lougheed way back in the day as a Director General at the Department of Intergovernmental Relations during the fights over the National Energy Program in the early uh, 1980s. And so she has a lifetime of experience of standing up for Alberta. Uh, she also went on to become a senior public servant for the Government of Canada as Deputy Minister for Western Economic Diversification. Uh, and so, has, as I say, has spent much of her life understanding the uh, issues uh, of and the tensions in the relationship between Alberta and the Government of Canada. And I can't think of a better uh, person to have chaired the Fair Deal panel. Uh, Aricia, over to you. Let me start by thanking Premier Kenny for having me here today and for entrusting the important work of the Fair Deal panel to my fellow panel members and myself. We understand the importance of ensuring our province is treated fairly in Canada, particularly during these trying times, and we were honoured to be selected. It was a real pleasure for me to be on the panel with a diverse and very engaged group of people all of whom are passionate about serving our province. We had a good variety of perspectives at the table, and I think that produced significant work, even if that work was made a great deal more difficult by the crises that we faced during the drafting of the report, the outbreak of COVID-19, and the drastic fall in oil prices with its massive impact on Alberta's economy. I'd also like to thank all of the Albertans who took the time to come out to a town hall session, to participate in meetings, send in an email or reply to our survey. Your participation was vital to our important work. We held 10 larger town halls across the province. We participated in 15 MLA town halls. We received thousands of electronic and handwritten submissions and over 40,000 Albertans completed the survey. We consulted extensively with experts, public policy groups, industry groups, municipal associations, business groups like the Chambers of Commerce and the Canadian Federation of Independent Business, and academics. You, Albertans, took the time to share your thoughts, and we simply could not have done this without your help. Traveling our highways and hearing how Albertans across the province feel as though we are losing our voice and identity in Canada painted a vivid picture of the difficulties we are facing. Albertans are con concerned about the energy sector and they feel like it is under attack. They're worried that their fellow Canadians don't have an accurate picture of the outstanding innovations and improvements taking place in the energy sector and across Alberta's economy and how a strong Alberta benefits our entire country. They're frustrated and disappointed at how we are treated by the federal government and other parts of Canada. They're struggling and they need help. Some asked for extreme responses, such as pursuing separation from Canada, but the majority did not. Many discussed proposed measures, such as pursuing a referendum on equalization looking into a provincial pension plan and an Alberta police force, and working towards true representation by population in the House of Commons and a more dem democratized Senate. Many saw opportunities for Alberta to assert itself better and strengthen its voice within Canada. The Fair Deal panel did its best to capture these opportunities in the recommendations that we submitted to government, 25 of them. Another important message also contained in these recommendations is that the Albertans we spoke to don't want special treatment or status in Canada. Instead, they just want to be treated fairly. Some 65% of Albertans told us they did not feel Alberta was getting a fair deal. They want our government to take concrete action to advance our economic interests 
and secure the best deal we deserve. It's my hope that this report gives a proper voice to these desires. And I encourage every Albertan to read this report so that they can clearly see for themselves the shape that this voice has taken. We heard Albertans ask for tangible actions to protect and strengthen our province. And I understand a fair amount of work is already underway. Again, on behalf of my panel colleagues and myself, I want to thank you, Premier, for the privilege and honour of listening to Albertans who care so passionately about this province and its future. And finally, before I end today, I do want to call special attention to the passing of one of our panel colleagues, Ch Chief Jason Goodstriker. He tragically passed away in January. The panel was deeply saddened and devastated by this loss, and we dedicate this report to his memory. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Aricia, and uh, thank you to all, of, as well, all of the members of the panel, including Preston Manning, Stephen Lougheed, uh, Donna Kennedy Glanz, uh, Professor Moin Yaha, and MLA's uh, Miranda Rosen and Tani Yao, who join us uh, here today, as well as Drew Barnes, and of course, as you've said, uh, my late friend, Chief Jason Goodstriker. All of these members took on the job of gathering Albertans' views on our place in the Federation, and they distilled what they heard into an historic document that is thorough, thoughtful, and constructive in its 25 recommendations. They heard directly from 2,500 Albertans at 10 large town hall meetings and gathered input from tens of thousands more, including dozens of experts and representatives of private and public sector organizations. They persevered despite the tragic loss of one of their members, Jason Goodstriker, a great Albertan who made immeasurable and irreplaceable contributions to his Kainai community and to the unity of our province. And they soldiered on through the onset of the global coronavirus pandemic and its catastrophic economic impact. What they heard from Albertans was often emotional, uh, by turns frustration and expressing frustration and anger, and sometimes it was heartrending. The report reveals uh, a people with great love for their province and their country, but also a people who have suffered through years of economic stagnation, mainly caused by bad policy choices by governments, especially the federal government policies that discriminate against our province and its largest industry, even as they enjoy the wealth that Albertans create for Canada. These confederal frustrations are not new. They date back to the terms under which Alberta became a province and even beyond that. But as bad as relations between our province and Ottawa have sometimes been over the decades, including the long struggle for provincial control over natural resources, that was finally achieved by Premier Brownlee in 1930, only to be, to be fought and secured all over again by Premier Lougheed during the epic energy and constitutional battles of the 1980s. Well, none of that, I believe, compares to the profound threats that Alberta's economy faces today and the impacts they are having on Alberta-Canada relations. The panel's report and recommendations summarize what can and must be done to end these threats, ease these tensions, and obtain a fair deal for Alberta within the Federation. To a great extent, the report and recommendations confirm the results of last year's provincial election when Albertans turned out in record numbers and voted to elect a government that committed to get our province working again by standing up for our jobs, our energy industry, and our right to control our economic destiny. Many of the panel's recommendations echo commitments made in our election platform, and we've been delivering on them since the day we took office. Indeed, our actions taken in pursuit of fair treatment for Alberta in just the first six months after the government was sworn in include the following. The immediate proclamation of the Preserving Canada's Economic Prosperity Act, or Bill 12, or the so-called Turn Off the Taps legislation, which gives Alberta the ability to restrict uh, the export of crude oil and natural gas re and refined fuels uh, if provinces uh, block our resources. Secondly, successfully pressing the Senate Transportation Committee to vote against the adoption of the Bill C-48 tanker moratorium, unfortunately later reversed by the Trudeau government. Thirdly, 
successfully pressing the Senate to adopt 187 amendments, including all of those proposed by Alberta's government, to Bill C-69, the so-called No More Pipelines Law. Again, sadly, almost all of those constructive amendments were repealed by the Trudeau government. Next, we secured uh, opposition to, to that bill, to that uh, No More Pipelines Law, from nine of the 10 provincial governments and two of the three territorial governments. We challenged the constitutionality of the federal carbon tax by supporting Saskatchewan and Ontario in their carbon tax appeals and by winning a resounding 4-1 to victory at the Alberta Court of Appeal, declaring the federal carbon tax to be unconstitutional. We secured support from all 13 provinces and territories for energy and resource corridors, with all but one province, Quebec, supporting energy and resource corridors that include oil and gas pipelines. We created the Indigenous Litigation Fund to support First Nations defending their economic development, including through resource projects, a fund which is now being used by the Woodland Cree First Nation to challenge the federal tanker ban, Bill C-48. And let me pause to say that sadly in the consultations of the task force, uh, uh, because of Jason Goodstriker's untimely passing, uh, we were unable to complete, I think, as the in-depth consultations with Indigenous peoples that was hoped for. And so I intend uh, to write to all of Alberta's chiefs asking that we place uh, the Fair Deal agenda on the agen uh, uh, for a discussion item at uh, this summer's uh, Crown First Nations meeting. We also, over the past year, launched the public inquiry into the funding sources behind the campaign to landlock Alberta energy. We passed into law the Senate Election Act, which had lapsed under the previous government, and it reinstates the right of Albertans to choose their nominees to the Senate. And we've renewed the call uh, on Prime Minister Trudeau to appoint uh, elected Senator-in-waiting Mike Shake to the position recently vacated by Grant Mitchell. We launched the Canadian Energy Centre to coordinate the fight back strategy for Alberta's energy industry. We created the Indigenous Opportunities Corporation, backed up to a billion dollars to support Indigenous financial participation and co-ownership of major resource projects and to help get federal approval. And I'm pleased to say that we've received dozens of applications uh, for that uh, support through that fund. We pressed the federal government to exempt Alberta from the Canada Housing and Mortgage Corporation stress test that has put home ownership out of the reach of tens of thousands of Albertans. And many of these actions are acknowledged in the Fair Deal panel's report. In fact, I think it's fair to say that Alberta's government and the Fair Deal panel are in complete agreement on the goal of all of their recommendations with only some minor contrasts on how or when to achieve them. So I'd like to address some of their key recommendations uh, individually, starting with several where the government's work is already well underway. These include recommendation one, which is pressing Ottawa to treat Alberta fairly under the fiscal stabilization program with a $2.4 billion payment. Let me just pause to say fiscal stabilization is basically what I call an equalization rebate or reverse equalization. It's a payment that is supposed to go uh, to typically have provinces who have seen, who do not receive equalization, but have seen a sudden collapse in their revenues as we did in uh, 2014 and again have done um, because of the collapse of energy prices now in 2020. So we've been unrelenting in calling for our province to be compensated for the huge revenue hits that we suffered uh, in those years as a partial rebate for the $40 billion we contributed to the rest of Canada in net fiscal transfers over the past uh, two years alone. We secured the unanimous support of the provinces for a fiscal stabilization rebate, as I say, and that pressure has already begun to pay dividends with the federal transfer of a billion dollars, which we agreed to uh, allocate to putting Albertans to work by rehabilitating inactive and orphan wells, creating, we hope, about 7,000 good paying jobs. We've also made tremendous progress on recommendation number three of the panel's report, calling on Alberta to lead the charge for free trade within Canada. Our government unilaterally removed 80% of Alberta's exceptions under the Canada Free Trade Agreement, and we secured the support of the other three Western provinces to invite Central and Eastern Canadian provinces to join the most uh, open free trade agreement in the country, the New West Partnership Trade Agreement, which is the gold standard of trade agreements across the country. And let me say we are continuing our work towards potential unilateral acceptance 
a professional and trade qualifications for people from across Canada, which is the biggest barrier to internal trade. On re recommendation four, as I said, uh, we've already obtained nearly universal provincial support for the concept of national energy and resource corridors, including pipelines, to get Alberta's energy products to new markets across Canada and around the world. And I'm pleased to announce today, in fact, that we'll be taking further action on this by designating Lac St. Anne Parkland member of the legislature, Shane Getson, uh, to chair an uh, Alberta task force on corridors and to continue this momentum working with industry, indigenous communities, municipalities, other provinces, and uh, other key players. And we passed the Alberta Senate Election Act, setting the stage for, as I said, another Senate election in conjunction with next year's civic elections and reviving efforts to democratize the upper house in Ottawa. Uh, in the meantime, once again, I've asked the Prime Minister to appoint uh, a democratically approved candidate, uh, Mike Shake. On recommendation 10, calling for market-based approaches to climate change regulation, we are implementing, as committed to voters, the Technology, Innovation and Emissions Reduction Program that incents private investment in reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And as our industry grows ever more competitive on emissions, we're pushing Ottawa to ensure that Canada gets international credit under Article 6 of the Paris Climate Accord for everything we're doing to achieve net reductions to global emissions. Uh, our four to one victory against the federal carbon tax in the Alberta Court of Appeal was a major rebuke of federal encroachment on provincial jurisdiction under the Constitution as called for in the panel's recommendation number 11. And we'll soon be launching legal action against uh, Bill C-69 as I've said. And finally, on recommendation 15, I'm pleased to announce today that we are moving to satisfy the call for the appointment of a Chief Provincial Firearms Officer. And Minister Schweitzer will speak to the details. But in combination with our actions last week to create a Firearms Advisory Committee and establish Provincial Firearms Testing Facilities, a Chief Provincial Firearms Officer will strengthen the rights of law-abiding Alberta farmers, ranchers, hunters and sports shooters, as well as uh, uh, gun stores and arbit from arbitrary effective federal firearms regulation. I should point out that yesterday afternoon, uh, the legislature uh, voted overwhelmingly in favor of the creation of a provincial firearms officer to implement this fair deal panel recommendation. I will just add uh, here that there have been uh, several other actions taken by Alberta's government that further advance our fight for a fair deal in the federation, although they were not recommended by the panel which is fine because I don't think the panel's recommendations are exclusive or, or comprehensive, but there's other measures that we can and will continue to take. These include our recent initiative to create uh, an Alberta Provincial Parole Board, that was in our platform, uh, and uh, our demand since day one that Ottawa reform uh, the employment insurance program which treats Alberta workers unfairly compared to many others in the rest of the country. Turning to panel recommendations that we have accepted in principle but on which we have not yet fully acted. Let me start with recommendation number two, to hold a referendum on equalization. The panel calls for a clear yes or no question on removing section 36 from the Constitution, which is the principle of equalization. The government of Alberta accepts this recommendation. Albertans understand that equalization is fundamentally unfair. Albertans are proud to contribute to their fellow Canadians when times are good here, but bad elsewhere. Albertans are happy to have had the opportunity to contribute mightily to the rest of the Federation, building roads, schools, and hospitals from coast to coast. But what Albertans cannot and will not accept is governments across the country benefiting from that wealth and our resources while seeking to block and impair our development of that wealth and those resources by killing pipelines, by opposing them through policies that hammer our largest industry that put Albertans out of work. And that's why Albertans want a chance to speak clearly on the principle of equalization, which is one of the largest parts of the whole system of federal transfers of fiscal federalism. In our platform, we said that we would hold this referendum in 2021 if the federal government did not repeal or fundamentally overhaul its attack 
on our hard-won provincial jurisdiction to control our resources under Section 92 of the Constitution, a fight that Peter Lougheed won in 1981. Sadly, the federal government has refused to listen to us. They refused the uh, almost a, all of the 187 constructive amendments adopted by the Senate and proposed by the government of Alberta to the No More Pipelines Law, Bill C-69. And they continue to refuse to re return to predictability certain and certainty in terms of regulations for those and other major projects. And so uh, that is one of the reasons that we are recommending this panel recommendation, excuse me, adopting this panel recommendation uh, to hold a referendum next year uh, on equalization, and we'll do more work on the precise question that will go to Albertans. The government further accepts Recommendation 8, which challenges the residency requirement that limits Albertans from serving on federal courts, as well as Recommendation 9, which advocates for more provincial control over immigration. And I should say that we do that in the context of our um, pending Alberta Advantage immigration strategy, which will much more creatively use Alberta's ex current uh, power over immigration uh, to, in the future, attract newcomers who can help to, to create jobs and grow our economy. And we accept in principle recommendation 12, which commends Alberta to work for a federal provincial agreement that would prohibit Ottawa from taxing, spending, legislating, or treaty making in ways that offend provincial jurisdiction without our agreement. And finally, Recommendation 25, which urges explore, exploring the ways that Alberta's cultural, economic, and political exceptionalism could be more clearly enshrined in law and policy. And I will be uh, mandating Minister of uh, Culture, Multiculturalism, uh, and Status of Women, uh, Leela, here to uh, develop a strategy in that area. Turning to recommendations that, in the government's view, require further analysis, these include number 13A and B, calling for replacement of the Canada Pension Plan in our province with an Alberta Pension Plan. Now, there are very persuasive arguments for such a move, which would save Albertans significantly on pension taxes, or would allow us to offer even more generous pensions than the rest of Canada gets for the same amount that we currently contribute. And that's primarily because we have the youngest population in Canada, so we are by far the largest net contributors to the CPP. There are also uh, multi, but I should say there are multi-year negotiations that would be required to make this happen and to ensure that every Albertan's current or future pensions are guaranteed. But we agree in principle with the panel that this recommendation should be studied in depth. So I have tasked the Department of Finance with preparing a detailed analysis of the costs, benefits, and structure of a potential Alberta pension plan. If that analysis concludes that an Alberta provincial pension would be a net benefit to Albertans, we would then proceed to give Alberta voters the final say on the proposal in a province-wide referendum. Likewise, on recommendation 14, calling for the replacement of the RCMP in Alberta as our provincial police service with a restored Alberta provincial police force. I say restored because we had one until the 30s. This also requires a detailed technical study because this would be a very uh, complex change, including a careful cost benefit calculation and a consideration of how this could align with timely reforms to ensure police forces are more responsive to the communities that they serve. And let me pause to point out that when it comes to the RCMP's contract with Alberta for policing, this primarily affects uh, smaller communities and rural areas, because of course the larger cities and most of the mid-sized cities have their own municipal police services. And so this is something that we, we need to study in depth, and I, I have therefore tasked the Department of Justice and, the, and Solicitor General with conducting a detailed study of this proposal, which will be completed and released next year. Lastly, in the government's judgment, just two of the panel's 25 recommendations require some modifications. We'll, while we accept the principle of rejecting federal intrusions into our own areas of jurisdiction, obviously, like health care, um, recommendation 19, uh, against an exchange of tax points for federal uh, funding conflicts, uh, I should let me, let me restate that. Recommendation 19 recommends against pursuing a transfer of federal cash transfers for tax points. But this is something that we committed to do in our platform. And so it's something that we're going to have to uh, study more closely. And then uh, let me finally say 
that there is um, recommendation 19. Uh, further analysis, as I say, on moving forward uh, uh, on a tax point transfer will be undertaken by the Department of Finance, recognizing that this is a long-standing Alberta demand that we share with Quebec. Likewise, the government reserves the right to some modifications of Recommendation 22, calling for no action to be taken on direct federal funding to Alberta public agencies and municipalities. While the risk of offending provincial autonomy here is real, the panel raises some valid concerns, I believe, about regulatory overlap and the government won't make any immediate changes pending further investigation and analysis. To sum up, as a result of the extraordinary events of the last three months, the government and the people of Alberta, like all governments and people across Canada, have been singularly focused on protecting public health and safety during the global pandemic. The necessary impairments of uh, uh, all kinds of social and economic activity have caused enormous damage to government finances, to employers large and small, and to the jobs and lives of ordinary people everywhere. One of the major macroeconomic consequences was the collapse in global energy demand, which the Saudis and Russians chose as an opportunity uh, to ratchet up oil production and drive prices to unprecedented lows. The consequences of this for Alberta, which after five years of stagnation had just begun to see some recovery of exports and investor confidence when the pandemic and price war hit, well, those consequences have been cataclysmic. We have to do everything in our power to protect the livelihoods of Albertans. And that includes removing all of the obstacles standing in the way of our economic recovery, including the bad policy choices that others, including the Ottawa government, have imposed on Alberta and on the Canadian energy industry. The report and recommendations of the Fair Deal panel are not a cry for help. They're a demand for fairness. Failure to get a fair deal for Alberta is not an option. The COVID-19 pandemic has been a disaster, but Albertans have managed it as well or better than any other place in the Western world. We're accelerating the relaunch of our economy and we'll soon unveil an ambitious economic recovery plan with a huge emphasis on uh, diversification while ensuring the future for our largest industry. Its success rests to a great extent on fair treatment of our province and our largest industry by Ottawa. So thank you again, Aricia, to you and through you to all members of the Fair Deal panel and to all Albertans who contributed to your report and recommendations. You have done an enormous service to our province and staked out what must happen to ensure that Alberta gets a fair deal and an economically successful future. Thank you, and now uh, we'll hear from uh, Justice Minister and Solicitor General Schweitzer on uh, some particular announcements, and then we'll ha be happy to take uh, media questions. Thank you again, Arisi, and thank you again to the hard work of the panel that you did over the last few months. And uh, thank you, Premier, for the opportunity to present here today and the tasks that you've uh, given my department for further follow-up. Uh, earlier this year, I had the opportunity to meet uh, with Federal Minister Blair, the Minister of Public Safety federally, as well as Minister Lametti, the Minister of Justice. When it came to firearms, we provided them with a clear message that they need to consult widely, consult with law-abiding firearms owners, Make sure that they get this right when it comes to policy. In response, however, we got half-baked measures that are gonna cost taxpayers hundreds of millions of dollars, criminalize law-abiding Albertans, and simply have a half-baked policy that was not fully thought through. This has caused an immense amount of frustration for Albertans. And the message that we sent to Ottawa was that the focus needs to be keeping people safe in their communities. Right now, 80% of the firearms that are used in crimes are illegally brought into our country from the United States. So we encourage the federal government to direct their resources to stronger border patrols, as well as making sure we go after organized crime. However, this fell on deaf ears. And let me be clear, Albertans have sent a clear signal to us, enough is enough. They're tired of policies being developed in downtown Toronto that don't work for the people of Alberta. That's why we're excited today to take the recommendation of the Fair Deal panel. We have started and commenced the formal process to establish a chief firearms officer here in the province of Alberta. That step is happening now, and we're joining with Saskatchewan in taking that step. Having our own chief firearms officer will ensure that firearms policies in Alberta are interpreted and implemented for Albertans by Albertans. 
An Alberta Chief Firearms Officer will be able to implement firearms policy and regulatory enforcement that better reflects our priorities and deliver services that better suit the needs of Albertans. Earlier this month, we created an Alberta Firearms Advisory Committee chaired by a member of the legislature, Michaela Glasgow from Brooks Medicine Hat. I'm confident they'll provide us with thoughtful recommendations on how better to assert this area of provincial jurisdiction and craft sensible policies for responsible Alberta firearms owners. Earlier this month, we also announced the establishment of an Alberta Parole Board. That legislation right now is going through our legislature. Again, this is a simple direction for us. We need more Alberta and less Ottawa in our justice system. This is a key part of us taking back responsibility for this area of the justice system. Also, as the Premier has already noted, my department has already started its homework on the establishment of a provincial police force. We've heard an immense amount of frustration from Albertans from every corner with respect to policing in this province. We need to get this right. We need to make sure we do this study to make sure we have the, all the information to make this important decision. This will also dovetail with the work that we're doing to review the Police Act here in Alberta to make sure we listen to Albertans to make sure we have a modern police force that's addressing community needs. Thank you, Premier, and I will be taking questions here momentarily. All right, operator, can you please put through the first caller? Our first question comes from Chris Barco of the Calgary Herald. Your line is open. Hi, I have two questions. One is for the panel chair and one is for the premier. Uh, for Rishya, I'm wondering what are the key risks and benefits for creating an Alberta pension plan? And why did the panel think that the benefits outweigh the risks at this particular volatile time? That's my first question. For the Premier, I'm wondering if you can uh, tell me, does the COVID crisis and the oil price collapse highlight the downside risks for Alberta to launch its own plan to replace the CPP? And can you give us a sense of the timeline on when you might see a referendum on this issue? The, um, the recommendation uh, on the Alberta Pension Plan is a complex one, and if I would highly recommend that you uh, read the report. There's a lot of detail in the report with respect to numbers and risks and benefits and the need to uh, do due diligence and look at the governance structures as well. Uh, so I would highly recommend that you take a look at that because I think a lot of what you're asking uh, is mentioned in that, but we do acknowledge that more, more work, more exploration needs to be undertaken. Thanks for the question, Chris, and thank you, Arisia. Uh, Chris, the way I would characterize the process is that the panel uh, listened to Albertans and heard that the majority of folks with whom they consulted believed that an Alberta provincial pension plan would be a net benefit for our province in many respects. However, obviously the panel was not mandated, nor did they have the resources to engage in a, a very deep technical study of all of the financial uh, and legal implications, and that's why I'm now tasking our Alberta Department of Finance to engage in that kind of detailed study, which would address all of the questions that you are asking. Uh, let me say that obviously uh, markets are will fluctuate from time to time. We've seen significant market fluctuation because of the COVID global recession uh, over the past four months, uh, but that's true for all institutional investors, all pension funds, all sovereign wealth funds across the world. It's not unique to Alberta, of course. Uh, what I would say is this, that the uh, fundamental reason we, I think Albertans want us to look at this is because of the major demographic advantage that we have with the youngest population in Canada by far, which means that we have more people paying uh, payroll tax into the CPP uh, compared to other provinces. This effectively constitutes uh, a, a net uh, ta tax transfer uh, to CPP beneficiaries in the rest of the country. So um, this for me is not primarily a question about uh, uh, investment returns, although we'd have to ensure that our uh, returns are competitive with other major pension fund funds, of course. It is primarily a demographic question. And uh, I know there's, you know, when we talk about unfairness for Alberta. A lot of the attention is put on equalization, understandably so. But of the $20 billion net that Albertans contribute to the rest of the country through their federal taxes, minus what they get back in, in benefits, that we can't, equalization is an important part of that. But we do not have a lever to pull to stop the equalization transfers as part of that. There is one large part 
of the system of fiscal federalism, which we could control directly, and that would be by asserting our right to create, like Quebec has done for six decades, our own provincial police, uh, sorry, uh, pension plan. And that's why I think the idea has merit, but it does require further careful study to address exact, uh, amongst other things, the questions that you have asked. And so uh, in terms of when this would happen, well, uh, the, uh, the finance department will engage in that to detailed technical study, including consulting out, out external uh, financial experts and others, and report back to the government uh, in 2021. Uh, and if uh, the recommendation is that this would be a net benefit for Albertans, then we uh, would proceed to a referendum which could potentially occur on the same day as uh, the 2021 October Alberta municipal elections. Operator, can you please put through the next caller? Our next question comes from Dean Bennett of the Canadian Press. Your line is open. Thanks very much for taking my call. Uh, just following up on Chris's question there, so obviously, Premier, this, this panel is to give you some guidance as to what Albertans want. It's a question for you and for Aresia, two parts. First off, where is the evidence in this report that uh, the majority of Albertans want to see uh, an Alberta police force and want a, uh, a separate pension plan? I mean, there's a lot of... Um, sort of anecdotal evidence, but the only statistical stuff I can find is on page 65, which says six out of ten Albertans don't want uh, uh, to leave CPP, and two out of three don't want to leave the RCMP. So where in this report do we find information to back up your statements that the majority of Albertans want this? And given if we don't have it, then why are we pursuing these two initiatives? Well, I'll uh, let Arisa speak to the contents of the report, but I can tell you, uh Dean, that we've also done in, a polling independent of the report, which has found uh, pretty significant support for the uh, possibility of an Alberta provincial uh, pension plan, for example. Uh, and let me hasten to remind you that this is something that Quebec has had uh, successfully uh, for six decades. I, I don't understand uh, why Albertans think we're somehow less capable of managing our own money than Quebecers are. I, I frankly find that notion uh, insulting. And uh, the advantages of a provincial pension would be demonstrably greater for us than it is for Quebec, because they have a much older population than we do. Um, let me just say that uh, uh, both of these areas obviously require further uh, study. On the question of a pension, we've committed that we would not move forward unless Albertans uh, endorse the concept in a, demographic, a democratic uh, referendum. Um, and with respect to police, I, I think it's important to, to remember that uh, the uh, RCMP policing contract primarily uh, uh, engages the interests of, of rural Albertans and people in smaller communities. Um, the two and a half million Albertans who live in Calgary and Edmonton and, uh, and many other, uh, then hundreds of thousands of others in mid-sized cities, uh, don't have day-to-day -day contact with the RCMP. So I think the, the conversation there primarily has to be with those Albertans uh, who would be affected by a change uh, like this, who are primarily in rural Alberta and smaller communities. And with that, I'll, I'm happy to invite Arisia. I would reiterate the, uh, the Premier's comments that uh, we heard this largely from rural Albertans. Um, I would also just remind, remind everyone that our we not only looked at our surveys, at the responses to the surveys, but we also listened to people at town halls, uh, and we listened and we uh, heard and read their submissions, uh, their electronic and written submissions, and we spoke to experts. So our conclusions and our recommendations ultimately reflect that. Operator, can you please put through the next caller? Our next question comes from James Keller of the Globe and Mail. Your line is open. Hi there. This is a question for both the Premier and the panel chair. Can you explain the argument for uh, removing equalization from the Constitution and specifically how it would benefit Alberta? I mean, the report notes it's funded by Ottawa, and we do know that there's a perception that the amount that other provinces get is unfair. So what is this about? Is it about changing or ending payments to other provinces, or do you envision a scenario in which Alberta somehow uh, comes out ahead with a net benefit of some kind? It was clear in our um, in our travels across the province and listening to people, and also, as I say, in all of the submissions we received, that people felt that the equalization uh, formula as it is today, uh, the system is not fair to Albertans, that Albertans end up 
uh, paying more through their tax system than they receive as a benefit. So the recommendation um, therefore reflects, reflects that sentiment. And I'll just add to that in saying that Albertans have broadly a deep sense of unfairness about how equalization and the whole system of federal transfers work. We have contributed over $630 billion more to Ottawa and the rest of the provinces than we've received back in benefits or services since about 1960. And even during uh, some really tough economic times here, we contribute, continue to make a net contribution of about $20 billion a year, m by far more than any other province. Ontario, which had a few years as a so-called have-not province, a net beneficiary, uh, is only making a net contribution of $13 billion, and they have almost four times our population. And so what Albertans say is, how can this be the case, even when we've been through, in a five-year economic trough, we've been running massive deficits while Quebec, for example, that receives about $13 billion in equalization has been running huge surpluses and has enjoyed five years of economic growth. Where is the fundamental fairness, the equity in that? And that's what Albertans want to be able to speak to. Um, I, look, I've always said that Albertans are uh, proud to be able to contribute to the rest of the country when times are good here and bad elsewhere. And, and I don't think Albertans are against the, the principle of equalization in and of itself, that there should be some degree of sharing across the Federation. What they object to is that this should be, uh, the formula, the structure of it should be so unfair, firstly, and secondly, that parts of the country and governments get to benefit from this net transfer of wealth while proposing policies that impair our capacity to produce that wealth, uh, opposing pipelines, oppo uh, laws like Bill C-69, threatening to shut shut down pipeline construction. So I think Albertans get it. They understand that the chance to speak to the principle of equalization is a powerful way of getting the rest of Canada's attention on our basic ask for fairness. And uh, I've always said it's about time we started to take a page out of Quebec's playbook and the way that they have managed to get so much focus on their agenda within the Federation, uh, we Albertans should learn from that effective maximization of leverage by sub, uh, uh, consecutive Quebec governments. And uh, that's in part what this would do. Um, I can tell you, I'm not, I, 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 we've done as again on the point of the police and uh, pension issues, uh, done uh, separate polling on this question and I've seen consistently 75, 80% of Albertans want to have their say on this. And finally, it's a message to Ottawa. If uh, they want to demonstrate good faith in the Federation uh, on, on, on issues like this, then they've got to respond on things like our basic ask for fairness on fiscal stabilization, which is reverse equalization in a manner of speaking, or by uh, repealing or fundamentally rewriting Bill C-69, which is a massive intrusion in our jurisdiction in our, and our economy. So I see these, these things as being linked, and I think the people who uh, uh, spoke to the panel uh, understood that intuitively, as do most Albertans. Operator, can you please put through the next caller? The next question comes from Bill Fortier of CTV News. Your line is open. Hi, Bill, are you there? Sorry, just had to unmute my mic. <laughs> Happens to us all these days, Bill. Uh, I know it's a, there's a lot of apps open at the same time here. Um, just I wanted to ask about, because the, the report does mention that uh, separation is not a useful tool for negotiation. And I'm wondering, because in all of your comments so far, nobody has mentioned separation or Wexit throughout this entire presentation. Was this Wexit movement that at least seems to be growing, uh, was it taken seriously? And, and why leave that out of, of all the comments here? In our, um, in our public consultations, there were some people who favored separation. There were also others who said we should use separation as a bargaining chip. Um, the panel did not feel that this, it, wasn't, it was not the majority, it was conclusively not the majority of Albertans who felt that way. Uh, and the panel felt that it was not a useful bargaining chip. 
uh, I should say that the conviction of the panel, um, and we believe all Albertans, is that uh, uh, Alberta's best bet is within Confederation. Operator, can you please put through the next caller? The next question comes from Janet French of CBC. Your line is open. Hi there. Thanks for taking my question. This is for the Premier. Obviously, some of the recommendations included here would open up the can of worms that is the Constitution. And I'm just wondering, you know, how much appetite do you think there is amongst your your colleagues across Canada, other premiers, and amongst the Canadian public generally for constitutional reform or discussions? Th thanks. A good question, Janet. Uh, first of all, I don't think there are a lot of recommendations that would require constitutional amendments. Obviously, uh, amending Section 36, the principle of equalization, could. Uh, but that uh, would be, I, I, I think, the only... Uh, fun well, of course, the democratization of the Senate um, based on the Supreme Court uh, uh, Senate reference case would require constitutional amendments. And arguably, getting to a truly fair representation of seats in the House of Commons would require uh, constitutional amendments to remove, reduce, or eliminate the floors uh, that existed at the time of Confederation. Um, but uh, so let me just say, I, I, there, I think for most Canadians right now, they are obviously fixated on um, getting through the pandemic and economic uh, recovery. Uh, but when we get back to something like normal in our country, I think it's legitimate to democratically debate uh, the structure of our constitution. Uh, I think a lot of these things, though, could be achieved without constitutional change. You know, the federal government could uh, offer a, a retroactive lifting of the cap on fiscal stabilization and to do so prospectively as well. That would be a huge way of addressing the unfairness of fiscal federalism, including equalization. They could fundamentally change the equalization formula. They could. Uh, repeal Bill C-69, they could repeal the tanker ban, they could add more seats for Alberta in the House of Commons, they could choose uh, through discretion to appoint senators who are elected by Albertans, I, I believe, without a constitutional amendment. They could address most of these issues creatively through their own uh, jurisdiction. So I don't think we need to get uh, into a whole Meet or Charlottetown style um, uh, mega deal in order to advance the cause of fairness for this province. And uh, I think most of this can be done uh, outside of the ambit of constitutional amendments. Operator, can you please put through the next caller? Our next question comes from Alicia Corvella of Post Media. Your line is open. Thank you, good afternoon. Uh, I think I'd like uh, both uh, the chair and Premier Kenny to um, talk on this. Um, I'm just wondering, does this document, and if, if, if you were to implement all of the recommendations here, do you view it as a pressure valve against separatist sentiment? And um, also, would it be fair to define this document or these recommendations as a form of sovereignty association? Uh, answer f f uh, to your first question is yes, and to the second question, no, Alicia. Uh, I do believe that many of the Albertans who have expressed separatist views in the uh, past year or so, um, what they're, I think what they're really looking for is that fair deal. And if we can get greater fairness in the Federation, I think that addresses many of the concerns that have bubbled up in the form of separatist frustration. Uh, at, at heart, I believe the vast majority of Albertans are patriots. Uh, they are proud of this country. Albertans have had a higher than average level of uh, enrollment, enlistment in the Canadian Armed Forces, for example. Uh, and Albertans understand that on our own, we're simply a, a land, completely landlocked jurisdiction, that we, we need the economic union to get to global markets. Um, and so I think both emotionally as patriots and practically as a resource producing province, most Albertans get it. But what they also get is a great deal of frustration about how we've been dealt with by, uh, by Ottawa and some other provinces. And so, yeah, that, that was in part the motive behind appointing the Fair Deal panel, what, which was to provide a, a pressure release, as it were, for that, that frustration that has been building up. And let's face it, we appointed this panel 
following the last federal election in which the Prime Minister openly campaigned against Alberta and its largest industry. I think that is without precedent in Canadian politics. And, and, and that heightened the frustration together with policies like the No More Pipelines law and, and so on. So this is a way of saying to Ottawa, listen to Albertans. We have been, we are um, big Canadians. Look at what we're doing on free trade. We're leading the way to free trade in this country. Uh, uh, look at what we're doing on, um, what we've done through fiscal transfers. A strong Canada needs a strong Alberta. That's the message that, that Albertans are sending. In terms of um, sovereignty association, I would not characterize this uh, it, it, using that phrase, uh, but I would say that if we were to achieve the vision of the Fair Deal panel, we would certainly have greater autonomy within the Canadian Federation, uh, a greater and clearer exercise of the original vision of Confederation from 1867. That's actually what we're asking for, and I'll invite Alicia to, uh, to offer her comments. The Fair Deal panel really never thought of it as a pressure valve as such, but we did want to hear um, the, what Albertans had to say about this. And there was no question that they were frustrated, they were disappointed, many were angry. And so it very much was an opportunity for some of that, um, those feelings, those very strong feelings that Albertans had to come out. We recognized that and uh, we were, um, I won't use the word happy, but we were, um, we welcomed hearing what they really felt because we felt it was important that they be able to have a say. Uh, in terms, uh, with respect to your question about sovereignty association, that's also some a phrase that we really didn't consider at all. But what I will say is what the Premier said is that um, it was more of a sense of Alberta exercising autonomy over areas in which it has jurisdiction. And that was a very strong underlying um, goal and objective for the, for the panel. Okay, we have time for one more. Operator, can you please put through the last caller? Questions from Myrna Zhuzkik of Radio Canada. Your line is open. Thank you. Yes, my question is for the Premier. Uh, Monsieur Kenny, il semble qu'il y a plusieurs des recommandations, et vous l'avez dit vous-même, qui ont trait à des projets ou des choses qui ont déjà été annoncées par le gouvernement, ou en tout cas qui s'inscrivent très bien dans votre stratégie, en tout cas les recommandations que vous avez acceptées. Alors, en quoi, en quoi ce comité, en quoi le travail de ce comité change votre stratégie et la façon dont vous allez vous comporter avec Ottawa à l'avenir? Écoutez, le comité a proposé les direction sur plusieurs enjeux qui n'étaient pas dans notre plateforme électorale. Je vous donne l'exemple de la création potentielle d'une agence policière albertaine, la création d'un euh, plan de pension potentiel de l'Alberta et plusieurs autres, plusieurs autres enjeux que nous n'avons pas d'abordés dans notre euh, plateforme auprès des électeurs l'année dernière. Alors, ça nous donne une certaine euh, direction Uh, par les Albertains qui ont participé dans les consultations uh, à cet égard. Ça nous donne une, une, uh, une certaine, uh, uh, une certaine um, pousse, si vous voulez, un, un coup de main vers, uh, le, 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 pour prendre au sérieux l'idée de création de forces policières, pensions provinciales et plusieurs autres enjeux que nous n'avons pas parlé aux Albertains Euh, dans les élections. Alors, euh, et en bout de ligne, je crois que c'est une vision d'une Alberta plus forte au sein de la Fédération canadienne. Ça prend plusieurs idées euh, du, du Québec et la façon par laquelle le Québec a renforcé euh, sa position dans la Fédération depuis euh, six décennies. Alors, euh, effectivement, La vision du euh, comité est un Alberta euh, plus euh, fort, plus vigoureux, euh, qui exercice les sortes de fonctions de pouvoir que le Québec a euh, euh, démontré depuis euh, euh, les dernières cinq, cinquante années. Okay, thank you very much.